hit record. Okay, fantastic. And then I want to welcome you all again, of course, to our Wednesdays on the Stoop. Now, many of you are regulars, which I love. I love seeing you. Um, but I do want to let everyone know who isn't a regular that we do this mostly weekly, 4 to 5 p.m. It's a space for people to get involved um, and find their community and do something maybe fresh or new with their writing or learn something new. However, Blue Stoop is going on vacation for two weeks. Um, so the next two weeks, we will not have Wednesday on the Stoop. And it's basically just an opportunity to give your Blue Soup staff a little bit of time <laughs> to rest and relax. Um, but we will be back after that. Um, and we will post on our social media and put it in our newsletter when we're back. So not to worry, just give us two weeks. Um, other than that, I want to go ahead and introduce Joel today. Thank you so much, Joel, for being here and I'm gonna read your bio. So a former Philadelphian, Joel Burkett, has published three environmental legal thrillers, Drink to Every Beast, 2019, about illegal dumping of hazardous waste, Amid Rage, 2021, about a coal strip mine permit battle, and Strange Fire, 2022, about fracking. And I hope that Joel will let us know about this book that has come out this year. All were published by Headline Books, and he is a retired environmental lawyer and was selected as the 2019 Lawyer of the Year in Environmental Litigation for Central PA by Best Lawyers in America. He has also edited two award-winning books, Pennsylvania Environmental Law and Practice and the Law of Oil and Gas in Pennsylvania. Burkett lives in Harrisburg, PA. And Joel, I'm gonna go ahead and let you take over. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Ashani and uh, everyone welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I've wanted to uh, talk with folks uh, at Blue Stoop for a long time so it's a lot of fun to be able to uh, talk with you. I uh, wish we could be together but I, I think I see some names there that I know are not from Philadelphia so I'm glad we're able to do this in this uh, venue because otherwise uh, you wouldn't be able to join. So the topic is uh, called uh, cheekily frack this book and uh, it's, it's about writing about the environment in fiction. Let's see, there we go. And that's my name. And uh, if you, the, the PowerPoint will be on my website, which is joelburkett.com. I checked right before the, um, uh, we began and it was still not up, but I have a feeling within a couple of hours, the PowerPoint will be up. Okay, hang on a second, that's not gonna work. And uh, thank you again for uh, uh, mentioning my books. These are the covers, uh, Drink to Every Beast, The Mid-Rage and Strange Fire. I've also written uh, two nonfiction books, Pennsylvania Environmental Law and Practice and The Law of Oil and Gas in Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, I, I have a fair amount of experience uh, as a writer, both of fiction and nonfiction and environmental issues. And, and we'll talk about what you need to do if you don't have a whole lot of background uh, in environmental issues, because I think anyone uh, could become a writer of environmental issues. It's, it's not limited just to people with a PhD or, a, you know, or, or a significant environmental degree. So uh, what are we talking about when we talk about environmental fiction? And what kind of books are we talking about? And I, I just put a few names up here uh, just to give you an idea of some of the books that are out there, but also to start you thinking in terms of the diversity of books that are out there that are called environmental fiction. So you've got The Monkey Wrench Gang, probably the granddaddy of all uh, environmental, modern environmental books. Jaws, which I believe is an environmental book. The Pelican Brief, uh, all about uh, uh, an environmental legal thriller. Heat and Light, a relatively recent book on uh, fracking and the overstory uh, piece of literature, very good piece of literature uh, and relatively recent as well. So just getting started here, the question is, you know, what is ecofiction? And ecofiction obviously is books and stories in which the environment, uh, which is the setting where the object plays a central role. So um, a, a book, all books take place somewhere. And what we're talking about specifically are books where the environment is either the setting for the story or the object of the story. And it's very important that that is the case because otherwise, uh, you know, every book, you know, whether it's a Jack Reacher novel or whether it's a uh, literary novel, every book could 
otherwise be considered eco-fiction. But we're talking about books now that are specifically set uh, in a way that the environment plays a central role in the story. And so the book may be about the environment, uh, it may be about protecting the environment or destroying it. Uh, so the, but the environment must play a central role in the story to be considered eco-fiction, I would say. And why does it matter? Uh, and we're gonna find out in a minute why it matters. I wanna talk a little bit more about uh, background, but we're gonna to get to why it matters, but I want you to be thinking about why it matters. Why did I do that? Oh, here we are. So I've, I, I've identified five types of eco-fiction. And I know that there's some other writers who are out there who have identified um, other, other um, uh, subcategories of eco-fiction. But let's talk about the five types of eco-fiction. And it's important to talk about them because I'm assuming that all of you are writers or that all of you are thinking about writing. And if that's the case, then you should be thinking about what kind of a book is it that I'm going to write? How is my book going to fit, fit into something called eco-fiction? And when you look at the titles that I had a few minutes ago up on the screen and you say to yourself, uh, these books are really different. You know, Jaws is very different than, uh, you know, than Heat and Light. I mean, these are, but they're all eco-fiction of one kind or another. And you've got to be deciding for yourself, how is my book? going to fit into this genre because there are certain expectations when you write certain kinds of books and, um, and you're gonna focus your book one way or another. So it does matter what kind of book you're writing. So I've identified these five categories of books. And again, if you're uh, trying to jot this all down really quickly, uh, it, it, it will be up, I'm, I'm thinking later today uh, is when, uh, uh, it'll finally go up. It's supposed to have gone up earlier, but uh, you'll, you'll find it on my website at uh, joelburkett.com. So you have eco-thrillers. We're going to talk about each of these in a minute, so don't worry about that. Eco-thrillers. We've got environmental thrillers. We've got environmental legal thrillers. We've got cli-fi, and we've got li literary eco-fiction. So there are certain common characteristics of environmental fiction. Number one is that, it, the, that they have to have as a critical setting, the environment. And the environment can be everything from someone's backyard to the Amazon rainforest. Uh, but it's gotta be a key component of the story and it may verge on being a character. So one of the early examples of this, which is really a great one, and we're gonna just take a look at a few words from that book is To Build a Fire by Jack London. I think many people read this in high school and uh, if you haven't read it lately, it's worth uh, getting a copy of it. It's a short story written by Jack London where uh, there is only one character in the story and, and he's just referred to as the man. And the other character is the environment. And you're gonna see in a moment how uh, Jack London presents these two characters in the story. Because keep in mind, merely because you're writing e eco-fiction and merely because your story you know, may be about um, trees, for example, uh, at the same time, there has to be conflict in your story. Otherwise, your story is probably going to be a, a, a pretty uh, boring story, quite frankly. So the classic example, of course, is To Build a Fire by Jack London. So here's how it starts out. Day dawned cold and gray when the man turned aside from the main Yukon Trail. He climbed the high earth bank where a little traveled trail led east through the pine forest. It was a high bank and he passed to breathe at the top. He excused the act to himself by looking at his watch. It was nine o'clock in the morning. There was no sun or promise of sun, although there was not a cloud in the sky. It was a clear day. However, there seemed to be an in, in dis, indescribable darkness over the face of things. That was because the sun was absent from the sky. And when you read that last line of really the first paragraph, the sun was absent from the sky, we start getting a sense of the conflict that's going to exist between the man, as he's referred to in the story, and the environment. By the way, an indescribable darkness, I think that's almost a biblical type phrase, indescribable darkness, like right out of Genesis. Uh, Jack London was a great writer, and uh, he was able to describe things like, in this case, the Yukon, and, uh, and create 
conflict where it would be very difficult ordinarily for people to think that it'd be possible to create conflict. So let's discuss for a minute eco thrillers. So are all of these books eco thrillers? Now, some of you may have read some of these books uh, or may have seen uh, movies about them because I think at least two of them have been made movies. So there's Zoo by James Patterson, which was made into a kind of a lame television series. There's the Monkey Wrench Gang, which may have been made into a book, but if you haven't read it, I would strongly advise you to read it. There's the Pelican Brief, which I know was made into a movie, and there was Bark Skins by Annie Pools. So all of these books I've seen referred to as eco-thrillers, and I have a problem with that because other than the fact that the environment plays a very, very serious role in each of these stories, they are really different stories. And I remember when I started seriously reading uh, environmental fiction, I was thinking to myself, you know, I've heard zoo referred to, I've heard other books referred to as eco thrillers or eco books. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what binds these books together? And there was very little that bound them together. And I, and I think frankly that they've been mislabeled, labeled, but you as writers have to be thinking to yourself, what kind of a book is it that I'm writing? Am I going to write a book more like zoo? Am I going to write a book more like the Monkey Wrench Gang? So, like I said, often they are, uh, you know, they are filed all in the same place. They're when reviewers review them or when people talk about them, they talk about them as though they're the same book, but they're not. And again, you as a writer have to be thinking to yourself, where does my, where's my book going to fit in? And if my book makes it onto the shelf over at uh, Shakespeare and Company, you know, where's my book going to fit in over there? What, what are they going to put it next to? A, a reason that you want to think about that is that readers are going to be looking for certain kinds of books. So if a reader is looking for an eco thriller, like the Monkey Wrench Gang, they may be looking for entirely something entirely different than what they are commonly referred to as an eco thriller, like Zoo or Relic. So I think there are lazy reviewers out there, and I, and I see them all the time, who refer to them all as eco-thrillers. But I think it's up to you as writers where you have to decide what kind of book it is that you're writing. So again, we're going to go into the details now, uh, but I, I do want you to be thinking about where will my writing fit? And there are some really discernible differences in, in this writing. So eco-thrillers, the books that I call eco-thrillers. You're going to see a lot of similarities between all of these books. Number one, key component, environment is the setting. Number two is that there's a catastrophe or calamity that will or has occurred. Three, the main character has to stop the catastrophe from occurring or put the genie back in the bottle. And four, in an eco-thriller, science fiction or horror elements play a key role. And when you look at the books that I, I believe easily fit into the eco-thriller examples. Uh, Jurassic Park. Now, Jurassic Park is a book about uh, scientists and profiteers uh, messing around with the genes of uh, ancient uh, you know, dinosaur relics. And then Relic itself is a book about uh, explorers who go to the Amazon and accidentally bring back with them a creature uh, that uh, really should have stayed in the Amazon. And Zoo is another story where uh, you've got uh, the uh, DNA of animals having been changed. These books all have within them a certain science fiction quality. And, and I think that that's an important thing to remember is that if you're going to write an eco thriller, then your book probably will have some science fiction quality to it. Now, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, Cli-Fi, which also has some uh, science fiction quality to it. But at least so far as an eco thriller is concerned, um, you know, all of these books, plus others, uh, Preston and Child wrote another book, uh, uh, the second book in the series called Reliquarium, uh, and others have written books that would fit into that category, and you can think of them. I actually have a list. If you go to my website on the blog, you'll see that there's a list of um, maybe, I don't know, six or seven books that I've identified in addition to these that I'd call eco-thrillers. Then, uh, what I do is I believe that there's another kind of a book that I'm going to call an environmental thriller. And this is very different. And you're going to see in a minute. Again, similarities are that there's a key, a key component. The environment is a setting in the book. Uh, second is that a man-made calamity is going to occur. 
third is that the main character is to stop the calamity from occurring. But the key difference in what I call an environmental thriller is that it's a realistic scenario. So generally speaking, there's no science fiction or horror elements, uh, but it may have a speculative fiction element, a, a what if uh, uh, type scenario in, in an environmental thriller. So what books are we talking about here? So the Monkey Wrench Gang, um, just, uh, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that if you're interested in environmental fiction, that you've read the Monkey Wrench Gang. It's, I, I, I've read it twice now. I read it a long time ago. And then I read it again about a year ago. And the book is as fresh as it ever was. It's a great story about, um, uh, they would have called themselves eco-activists, but in the story, Edward Abbey often refers to them as eco-terrorists uh, who are roaming around in, uh, in uh, the Southwest, trying to undo what they can of uh, development that's taking place in the, in the uh, Southwest. A great book, it's a great story, and uh, definitely, worth, uh, definitely worth reading. And then Drift by John McGoran. Some of you may know John. John's a Philadelphia writer, and John has written a story that has maybe a little bit of uh, science fiction in it, but it's, it's a story about a um, detective who takes a little break and goes up to uh, Bucks County uh, to relax for a few weeks. And while he's up there, he gets involved in an environmental issue. And then Oil and Water, uh, written by my friend Pam Lazos. And Pam uh, has written a book, actually, she's from Lancaster. Her story is set uh, a lot in Philadelphia and also in Bucks County. Uh, so um, another story about uh, an environmental uh, uh, crisis that's taking place. But again, it's not a science fiction type book. And when you look at something like Edward Abbey's book, the Monkey Wrench Gang, and you compare that, say, to uh, Jaws or to um, uh, Relic, or one of those other stories, you see that there's a significant difference because uh, Abby is writing a realistic scenario and Patterson and uh, Preston and, and, and uh, Lincoln Preston is writing a, a different kind of book. So a very, very different kind of story. And again, you need to be thinking about this. Where's, where's my book fit in? Is it more like, uh, is it more like uh, the Monkey Wrench Gang or is it more like uh, Jaws. So uh, we now move to what I like to write, which are environmental legal thrillers. So again, similar similarities, key component, environment is the setting. Uh, there's a man-made calamity that's occurring or has occurred. A uh, main character is a lawyer in this case who must resolve a legal case uh, to bring justice or prevent the calamity from occurring again. And again, like an environmental thriller, uh, it's a realistic scenario. Uh, it does involve courtrooms or investigations. So it's, it's much more like um, an environmental thriller rather than an eco-thriller. And Grisham's The Pelican Brief, he's actually written three books uh, that I would call environmental legal thrillers. The Pelican Brief is one. He's written um, The Appeal, and he's written Gray's Mountain. And then I, I put up here two of my books, Drink to Every Beast, which is about an investigation uh, having to do with dumping hazardous waste into the uh, Susquehanna River that results in the death of two teenagers. And then my most recent book, Strange Fire, which is about a dispute over uh, a fracking uh, in, that takes place up in Bradford County. So these are environmental legal thrillers. Uh, there's no science fiction in them. Uh, there's no, uh, really no speculative fiction in them, but they are more uh, realistic kinds of books, similar to environmental thrillers. Next is cli-fi. So where do we get the term cli-fi? Cli-fi is like sci-fi. And that tells you right there that there's something uh, different about these books. And the key component again is that the environment is the setting, but this time it's particularly the climate. And I've read a lot about cli-fi and I've read some cli-fi books. Um, many of these books are set in the future, which automatically makes them speculative fiction, if not science fiction. I'm writing a cli-fi book right now that's actually set in today. And um, it's, I, I don't know if technically it's cli-fi or if it's technically it might be considered more environmental fiction, but it's about climate, it's about a climate issue. But I think uh, people are, who, who follow these things um, are, are saying that basically all books that deal with climate as an issue are falling into the cli-fi category. And once again, you have uh, a catastrophe or calamity that has occurred or will occur. And of course, with climate change, uh, we, unfortunately, we all know what that could be. 
Uh, and what uh, many of the writers have done in these books is try to imagine what will happen in the future. And some of the books take place hundreds of years in the future. And uh, they're trying to imagine the change in our planet as a result of uh, climate change. And uh, the fiction has to do a lot with that. In all of these books, the main character is to stop the catastrophe from occurring or try to put the genie back in the bottle, often uh, an impossibility. Uh, the, book, the books often have science fiction elements, and very often these books are dystopian, as you can imagine. And when you're talking about, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, the uh, um, short, you know, uh, cities and towns and villages along the coast being, um, you know, being inundated by water, and you're talking about horrific storms, you're really talking about a sort of a dystopian future. And just a few examples, uh, Michael Crichton's book, State of Fear, which we'll come back to in a second, Barbara Kingsolver wrote a, a great book called Flight Behavior, Annie Pruel's book, which is really an interesting book because she goes from uh, the past into the future uh, called Bark Skins. And I think Bark Skins may have even been made into a uh, short series. Um, so, you know, those books and more, because more and more books are coming out now, uh, people want to write about the climate. And um, the question you've got to ask yourself is how far in the future am I going to set my climate book? If you're thinking about writing a book about the climate, are you going to write it set, say, now, like my book? Are you going to write a book uh, uh, set 10 years in the future? Are you going to write it set 100 years in the future? And obviously, the further off into the future you write your book, the more likely it is that you're going to have science fiction elements in the book. Not that it's going to be what I would call hard science fiction, but that there are going to be things that are different about how we communicate, how we travel, and all of that. So um, you want to be thinking about that. Michael Crichton's book is very interesting. Uh, he's actually a climate, was actually a climate change denier. Uh, I put the book there because he, this is a book about climate. And, um, uh, and he, uh, you know, is critical about uh, uh, climate change. Maybe the only fiction book I've ever read that was footnoted. Um, it's worth reading because uh, Crichton is a good writer. And he wrote some really remarkable books. Uh, this one, I, I didn't agree with his point of view, but uh, it is a, I, I would think it does fit into the cli-fi uh, category. And finally, we get into environmental lit literature. So uh, what we're dealing now with is, again, uh, that the uh, key component is the environment is the setting. And we have to ask again, uh, is there a natural or man-made calamity that's going to occur? And the answer to that is maybe. Often there is, and it may be something as simple as a tree being chopped down, or it may be something uh, more disastrous as uh, an entire area being, um, being uh, you know, dug up and, and, uh, or burned to the ground. It's more of a realistic scenario. And generally speaking, there's no science fiction or horror elements, but there may be some speculative fiction elements, meaning, uh, you know, what if, X occurs, what if Y occurs? But generally speaking, environmental literature is like any other literature, but again, the focus is more on environmental issues. So books like uh, The Overstory by Richard Powers, a great book, um, Bountiful Calling by Fred Burton, uh, who wrote a book about fracking uh, that uh, I've read and he says is not an environmental thriller, but is environmental literature. And Bewilderment, which I've not yet read uh, by Richard Powers again, um, it's on my reading list and my to be read book, although I understand it's quite a long book, but I'm, I'll get to it one of these days. Uh, Bountiful Calling is a, about a kind of a fracking disaster in the sense that it traces a time up in uh, uh, either Susquehanna County or Bradford County, Pennsylvania, when uh, the drillers come in and overrun a, uh, a township and uh, uh, results in uh, destruction, really, of what the local people find uh, important and beautiful and, and meaningful to them. And uh, they are quite, I mean, it's quite, really fits into the environmental literature uh, category. Um, Fred is another Pennsylvania writer, by the way, a guy who lives in Harrisburg, actually not too far from me. And we, we appeared not too long ago on a program for Penn Future, uh, talking about uh, fracking in literature. So the question you want to be asking yourself is, what kind of environmental novel are you going to write? And we've been sort of 
delving into that. And it's important for you to be thinking about that because the uh, expectations, it really is a big decision. Thank you for popping up like that. It really is a big decision because it will guide you. If you're writing a thriller, for example, there are going to be some expectations that your readers are going to have. If you're writing uh, literature, where, you know, there are different expectations. And I think that that's um, something that you need to be thinking about as you're writing your story. And actually thinking about it before you even begin writing your story, because it is a big decision. So what are the big issues? I seem to like the word big. So one issue that you need to think about is your bias or your approach to the book. So assuming now that you've picked out a, that you're gonna write an eco thriller or you're gonna write environmental literature, you're gonna write cli-fi, whatever it is you're gonna write, and, I, and I'm not suggesting one or the other, you've gotta decide, well, what's my bias? What's my approach going to be in this story? Am I gonna be pro an issue? Let's say, let's say fracking for a second. Am I gonna be pro fracking? Am I gonna be anti-fracking? Am I gonna present fracking down the middle? And how are you gonna handle the balance? And there's a reason for, for this. There are several reasons for this. One is, if you write a book from a certain perspective, I think it's very possible, even likely, that you're going to attract certain readers. So if you write a book that's strongly anti-fracking, and uh, I think there have been several of them that have come out now and more that will be out. But if you write a book that's strongly anti-fracking, you can almost bet that people who are in the middle and haven't made up their minds yet for people who are anti-fracking, I'm sorry, pro-fracking, are not gonna read your book. They're just not gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna feel as though there's, that there's too much bias <clears throat> in the story. Likewise, if you write a book that's very, very pro-fracking, I think you're gonna find that you're gonna alienate other readers. You know, people who are anti-fracking are not gonna have, wanna have anything to do with your book. Uh, if you go down the middle, I mean, are you gonna be able to present both sides in a, in a way that's, that seems even-handed? And a reason you wanna be concerned about this is not just the, um, the economic reason, meaning that you wanna sell books uh, to as many people as possible. Or, and you want as many people as possible to read your book, but to the extent that you want to influence people, to the extent that you want to um, make a difference so far as your reader's understanding is concerned, one thing you want to try to avoid doing is putting off your reader, or it, worse yet, insulting your reader. So I think you've got to be thinking about that as you're starting to write your book. Am I going to take an approach? You know, it's when you read. Um, uh, when you read, for example, The Monkey Wrench Gang, very, very strongly pro-environment, strongly activist-oriented book. Um, what Abby was able to do in that story was to write a book that I think made people understand through his characters why his characters felt so strongly about protecting the environment that they're willing to become you know, strong activists. And by the way, by strong activists, I mean, one of the things that they're trying to do is blow up a dam. So, I mean, they're not, they're not just, you know, they're not just tagging, um, you know, billboards and the like. I mean, they're, they're really out there. But he was able, I think, in his story to make people understand why it is that they felt the way that they did. And Abby, who, I, and who died not too many years ago, I guess, Abby wrote uh, several books, uh, similar books like that, um, and he was very clear about one of the things he wanted to do was he really wanted to influence people. And he was, I think, very successful in, uh, in uh, Monkey Ranch Gang. But you have to decide, am I going to write a book that's going to be so one-sided that it's going to put off readers and other people aren't going to want to read it? Or am I going to write a book that, that I, frankly, I just don't feel comfortable writing? So you've got to think about all of those issues as you're starting to write your book. And these are things that I believe you're going to decide before you ever begin writing. And then there are going to be moral issues. They're going to come up in your, in your book. And you're going to have to decide how you're going to handle uh, these compelling moral issues. So, you know, what moral code are you going to follow? You're going to follow a Western moral code, an Eastern one, an indigenous one, a Judeo-Christian moral code. You're going to have to decide as you're, as you're, um, 
as you're thinking about your book and thinking about how you're going to handle various issues uh, about the moral issues that are involved in your story. And I personally think that when your main character or when your characters are faced with conflicting moral issues, that that's going to uh, do well for your book. And by that, I mean all books, regardless of what kind of book it is, whether it's literature, whether it's Little Women, whether it's, you know, um, you know, the Monkey Ranch Gang, whether it's Zoo, whatever the book might be, all books require conflict in them. And the conflict may be between two brothers. The conflict may be between a group of sisters. The conflict may be between sisters and a publisher. The conflict may be, you know, all different kinds of conflict, but books to be interesting require conflict of some sort. So uh, having conflicting moral issues in your story, I think is going to make your book a much more interesting story. And when you have morally conflicting issues, that will create conflict as well. And I think you wanna be thinking to yourselves, well, okay, how am I gonna introduce in this story morally conflicting issues? And um, I think when your main character has to deal with these morally conflicting issues, uh, it's, um, it's gonna make your story much, much more interesting. And uh, we see one right now uh, that I personally believe is being manufactured, uh, but I don't, but you see it out there right now so far as fracking versus, uh, let's call it patriotism, because that's the way I've seen it presented. Uh, there are certain people in the legislature, I won't say who they are, but there are certain people in the legislature who are saying that we should be promoting more drilling, more fracking, more fossil fuels as the patriotic uh, thing to do. And then there are people on the environmental side that are saying that's BS, that uh, there's nothing particularly patriotic about that. What we should be promoting is uh, getting away from fossil fuels altogether. And merely because there is this awful war being raged by this awful person in Ukraine doesn't mean that we, we ignore climate change. And so you can see in that conflicting moral issues, you know, and maybe it's just a made up moral issue, which I happen to think it is. Uh, but the fact of the matter is you've got uh, on the one hand, this very, very strong issue about climate change and about trying to um, reduce the amount of carbon that's going into the atmosphere. On the other hand, you've got people saying, and you can read the articles there this week in the newspaper and online, you can read articles about people who are saying, if, you, um, you know, if you're a quote patriot, then you're going to be in favor of additional drilling and additional fracking. So these are moral issues that you can introduce into your story and that I think make your story more interesting. And especially if you've got a main character who's got to deal with those issues. And uh, this is basically what I just said. So, um, you know, one thing that you've got to be thinking about is, will I be turning off readers who I may be able to influence? And I think that's a really important thing to think about. Environmental uh, literature of all kinds uh, is very much advocating uh, the environment, protecting the environment, um, doing the right thing so far as the environment's concerned, limiting uh, carbon emissions for the most part. You're gonna see these issues over and over again in environmental literature. And so one thing you wanna be, you wanna be able to do is do more than just simply preach to the choir, I think. I think one of the things you want to be able to do is to speak to a wide audience and not just people who are you know, in agreement with you. And certainly if you can do that in your story and influence people at the same time, that's, that's a, a cool thing if you can do that. So uh, in writing a novel, I think that there are 10 things that uh, you need to do when you're writing your novel. And this really relates to um, all kinds of writing. And by the way, I'm gonna speak for about another five or 10 minutes and then I'll take questions, be happy to take questions. So um, one of the things that I've talked to many people about, and this applies to environmental literature, applies to everything, is 
I, I, I've lost track already of the number of people who tell me, I want to write a book, but I don't know how to get started. And the most important thing you can do is write. Sit down and write. And if you've got an idea in your head about some kind of environmental fiction, and you've been thinking about it and mulling it over and dreaming about your book and thinking about it in bed and thinking about it in the shower and thinking about it, you know, day and night, but you haven't yet started to write your book, just sit down and start writing it. And whether it's a book or a story, by the way, you want to just sit down and start writing. Uh, when you read, um, and I'll, I'll show you a couple of these books in a minute, when you read books like Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird, or when you read Stephen King's um, On Writing, you know, one of the things that they say is that you've got to get over the procrastination, you've got to get over the fear and just write. And one of the things that they both say, both King and Lamont say, is that one of the fears that writers have is that they, they think that their first draft is going to be crap. And therefore, they don't want to put down something that's not going to be well written. And both of them strongly say, don't worry about the fact that your first draft is going to be crap. Uh, rather, sit down, write, don't show your first draft to anybody, that's just for you. And then you're gonna edit and edit and edit until that first draft becomes the kind of thing that, uh, that is um, worthwhile and something you can show to an audience. The other thing I'm gonna urge you to do is to read. And I suspect talking to this audience that we're not dealing with a group of people who are not readers. I suspect all of you are readers, but if you wanna write environmental literature of some kind, you should be reading environmental literature and seeing what other people have done. If your goal in life is to become the next Patterson or, you know, or the next um, you know, uh, Grisham, uh, then the thing you've gotta be doing is reading all of those books that you possibly can get your hands on and just immersing yourself in what it is that they do. You know, Patterson is a very, very successful writer. And I, you know, I know that people who are Literary types tend to look down their noses at a guy like Patterson, and I understand why. But on the other hand, you can't deny his success. And one of the things that I think you want to do is you want to understand, if I want to write books like that, I should become very familiar with books like that. And I should be reading every uh, eco-thriller I can get my hands on. And likewise, if you want to read, uh, uh, if you want to read, um, uh, say, environmental, environmental uh, fiction, you should be reading all the environmental fiction you can get your hands on. Cli-fi, there's, like I said, there's this gigantic new body of cli-fi that's coming out. It's coming out almost on a daily basis. There's so much cli-fi that's being written. But if you're interested in cli-fi, see what other people are doing. Some of those books, like I said, you know, take place 100, 200, 400 years in the future. Some of the books take place tomorrow. And I think it's important for you to read those books and see what other authors are doing. Not that you're going to copy them, because I know you won't. Not that you're going to try to, you know, copy their structure or any of the rest of that, but you want to see what is uh, being written there. And the other thing, too, that I'm going to really urge you to do is that there are many, many billionaire <laughs> writers out there now, you know, people like Patterson or King or, uh, you know, others who are out there who have made a ton of money and who have been writing dozens and dozens of books. And God bless them. I Congratulations to those guys. But there are many, many debut writers out there, many, many people who have written one book, many people who don't have a book that's with Random House or with a small, a small uh, independent publisher, but who have, uh, uh, you know, self-published a book. Read those stories. And you want to read those stories because those are the people who I believe are on the cutting edge. You know, they're writing things that are really different. They're writing things that defy conventions. They're writing things that, uh, you know, that the big guys aren't writing. And by the way, Patterson doesn't need, you know, your $29.95 for his book. Uh, but, you know, the guy who's, who's writing his debut novel uh, that is a um, self-published book, I suspect he will be, he or she will be grateful. They will be grateful uh, that, you, that you spent, you know, $4.95 for their ebook. So whatever you do, uh, not only read, but try to find books that are written by debut novelists. A question that you're going to ask yourself, and we've been talking about this all the way through, is what do I write? And I'm not going to go over that again, other than say I want you to think about what you're going to write. Think about it before you uh, sit down and start writing. 
and uh, think about your story, think about your point of view, think about uh, the, um, the uh, uh, perspective that you wanna have in the story, think about the moral issues that you want to blend into your story, uh, think about the conflict that you're gonna have in your story. You know, you can't see it, but over here at my writing uh, desk, I'm pointing to it, is just the word conflict. That's all it says on it, it's just conflict. I, I had it, I used the biggest font I could find and I just wrote out conflict. And it's just a little reminder to me every time I look over there to see the word conflict and remember, oh yeah, I've got to make sure that there's conflict on every page if I can at all do that. And the conflict doesn't have to be people beating up on each other, but the conflict could be uh, an inner conflict. It could be inner turmoil that your main character is having. It could be conflict between two characters, uh, not a violent conflict. It could be a um, uh, conflict in terms of what's the right thing to do. But you want to think about that as you're writing. But another important thing, the one I have listed here is number four on my 10 things, is research. And this is perhaps the hardest thing for you to do if you're going to be writing environmental fiction. So much of environmental fiction requires you to have some knowledge about subjects that maybe you haven't thought about in a long time. It might be biology, it might be geology, it might be hydrology, it might be genetics. I mean, all of these things are part of the research that you're gonna to have to do. And you're gonna spend a fair amount of time researching these things. Um, in the overstory, for example, uh, there's so much botany in that story. And I don't think that Powers is a botanist, but you know, you've got to, you've got to be willing to do and put in the time to do that kind of research so that your story uh, isn't, isn't, doesn't have a made up feel to it. Uh, and so, for example, when I wrote uh, my most recent book, Strange Fire, although I knew a fair amount already about fracking uh, from my experience as an environmental lawyer, I did a lot of research because I wanted to make sure that I got it right. There's geology in that story. There's, uh, there's drilling that's in that story. And fortunately for me, because of my uh, past, I have a lot of friends that I could reach out to. So in terms of, uh, of the uh, geology in the story, I reached out to actually two geologists that I know who took a look at some parts of the story for me and made sure that, uh, that, you know, that I didn't get anything wrong. Cause I, you know, it, it, you know, it's, you see these programs on television, for example, let's say uh, a doctor show and in those medical programs, you know, they, they try to get it as right as they possibly can. But every now and again, it's just like a clunk. And you say to yourself, that can't possibly be right. Um, but, you know, if you ever look at the credits as they're rolling by, you'll, you'll notice that there are always two or three or four uh, medical consultants in those books uh, or in those, um, in those uh, shows and in those uh, movies and the like. And that's because they're running the medical issues past their medical consultants to make sure they're getting it as right as possible. And even then, they don't. So you wanna to try to um, get those things right. I read a story not too long ago and uh, I was really disappointed because it was about a, uh, an investigation being conducted by a state agency of an environmental calamity. And um, it was a major environmental calamity, meaning that many people were killed as a result of it. And the only one who was investigating it was a single investigator from the state agency. And I remember thinking to myself, that, that would just never happen. I mean, if it were, let's say Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania may, may start out with a single DEP uh, inspector going out to the site, <clears throat> but before too long, the inspector will call up and bring in a whole team as soon as the inspector realizes that there are you know, other people who need to come in and they may be a, a chemical lab laboratory, it may be geologists, it may be hydrogeologists to be coming in. Uh, likewise, on a really major situation like that, there will be uh, a, a reaching out to EPA that would take place. There would be um, perhaps criminal investigators would be coming in. But I, I think the important thing there is to uh, do some research. Here's a book I'm reading right now. I've never seen this book before. And uh, I would suggest that you all read it if you want to write environmental uh, literature, and especially if it's about a, a calamity of some sort. And it's nonfiction, but it reads like fiction. It's called um, The Chemical Canary by Robert Dugoni. Now, Dugoni is a um, thriller writer, 
And when I saw it, I saw the word chemical. And I thought, well, I wonder if this book would have any interest to me at all. What it is, it's about this awful environmental uh, situation that occurred in, uh, in Idaho now about 20 years ago. And Dugoni teamed up with one of the investigators and they wrote a book that is a very, very detailed book about how EPA, uh, uh, the, the criminal side of EPA, how they do an investigation. I mean, it is a little, <laughs> a little bit much at times, but when you read that book, you get a really, really good sense of what it is that goes into an environmental investigation and what it is, how an environmental investigation on the criminal side is different than a civil investigation. There are other books that are like that. That's probably the best one that I'm that I've ever read in terms of um, in terms of how uh, the uh, EPA investigates something from a criminal perspective. But there are other things that are out there like that. There are plenty of articles that are out there. Your research is probably I have listed here as number four. But really, if you're going to be writing a book of, of environmental fiction, whether you're writing about trees, whether you're writing about the ocean, whether you're writing about the Amazon, you're going to want to have, you're going to have to do a lot of research. If you're writing about climate change, you're going to need to do a lot of research. Climate change is devilishly complicated and complex. And when you take a look at the list of scientists, for example, in the IPCC, the kinds of scientists who come in to participate in the IPCC, we're talking about not just climate scientists and meteorologists, you're talking about uh, botanists, you're talking about biologists, you're talking about glaciologists. I mean, you're talking about you know, more ologists than you can shake a stick at. And they all have a role to play you know, in, um, in investigating climate change. And I'm not saying that you've got to become a super expert. You know, you've got to become the next Michael Mann, for example, uh, if you're gonna write a book about climate change. But you're going to have to have an appreciation for it. And if you're focusing on one thing in particular, if you're focusing on, um, I don't know, uh, glaciers melting in the Antarctic, uh, you're going to need to know something about that. And you're going to want to speak with some authority or write with some authority in your book. So uh, certainly the, um, the research component is very, very important to your writing. I've listed these other things here. I've actually written about this. If you go on my website, I've written a thing called uh, the 10 things that you ought to do if you're going to write a book or a story, in particular a novel. But, you know, all these other things, whether you use an outline or no outline, attending writing courses like this one, uh, whether you join a critique group, you know, how long is it going to take? How hard is it to do that? And whether you uh, try to get an agent or go directly to uh, one of the smaller houses or self-publish, all of that is in, in that. And I would just refer you to it so I don't uh, spend up the rest of the time talking about that. But really write, read, and research. Those are your three things you're going to need to do. Like I said, it's in my blog. So three books that I would strongly recommend to you if you haven't already uh, got them in your library are The Basic, Strunk and White. You might've gotten this in high school. Uh, you know, they handed it out to everybody at some point or they made you read it at some point if you took any kind of a creative writing course. It's still an important book. It's, it's old now, it's a little bit dated in some regards, but it's still a very important book in terms of some of the basics of writing. Plus it's really short. Uh, the other two books that you're going to want to read, because they're both uh, writing guides as well as memoirs, is Stephen King's book on writing and Bird by Bird by Annie Lamott. Both books are great books. I strongly recommend that you read both of them because uh, they have a lot to offer and they will teach you a lot about writing. And, uh, and that will apply whether you're writing environmental literature or whether you're writing another kind of a book. It doesn't matter. They're, they're all very helpful. And like I said, uh, today's program will be on my blog. <clears throat> this uh, this uh, uh, PowerPoint will be on my blog, so you can just go there and take a look at it. And thank you very much. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. There we go. Hi, everybody. So uh, now I don't have see little teeny pictures of you. I see larger pictures of you. Uh, did we get any, uh, Ashani, did we get any questions while I was talking? So it looks like we don't have any questions in the chat, although Mona, I believe, recommended Steering the Craft by Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, but we do have 10 minutes left. So if anybody has questions now, I think you can feel free to unmute um, and share them with the group. Um, or 
Yeah, so I think we see Stefan first and then Mona. First of Hi, all, Joel. Hi, Stefan. I haven't seen you in a long time. No, it's a long time. It was great working with you in the past. It was great listening to you now. I have a question, which is about what part of writing do you feel for you, from your perspective is most challenging, where you see kind of struggle to get the things correct or where you uh, find thresholds to try to slowly climb over and so on? What, what is that for you? Uh, that's a great question. Actually, um... I've done a lot of interviews and I've been interviewed a lot. And Stefan, you get the prize. That's the first time I've been asked that question. That's a great question. <laughs> um, the, uh, and not surprising knowing you. Um, probably the, I'm going to tell you what it is and then I'll tell you what it is. It's not getting the idea for the book. Uh, generally, I'll, I'll get an idea for a book or a story and then I'll write it down. I have over here, here we go. I got my little moleskin book here that you can see. And I just write down ideas from time to time. And some of them, you know, will, will turn into stories. Some of them will turn into novels. Uh, some of them are just going to be there. And someday when, when uh, some big university has my archives, they'll say, oh, look, he thought about writing a book about birds um, that he never wrote. <clears throat> but I, I just write down ideas. I get ideas. And I, and I just jot them down. I, I don't seem to have any trouble doing that. And also, I don't, I don't outline any longer. I've now actually written seven or eight manuscripts. And I don't feel the need for a, a detailed outline. So I don't worry about that. Although I was just on a panel uh, two weeks ago about whether or not to outline and what kind of outline to use. And I know many, many people swear by a variety of outlines and methods, uh, but I'm, I'm very comfortable not working with an outline, uh, sort of standing out there um, you know, on the high wire. <clears throat> the, um, the stories seem to flow when I'm writing them. So that's, that's also not a problem. But the thing that I find the most daunting, the most difficult, and the thing that I would work on the hardest is the research. Because if I'm writing a story about fracking, I wanna make sure I get it right. If I'm writing a story about coal mining, as I did in my uh, story of mid-rage, I wanna get it right. And it's very important in, in, uh, in a mid-rage, there's a, there's a lot of discussion about blasting. And uh, fortunately for me, I had a friend who was a licensed blaster. Sadly, he's just passed away. <clears throat> but he, um, he had uh, actually taken me out in the field. I did the equivalent of a ride along with a licensed blaster, which was a, an excellent experience. I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning because he started at the crack of dawn. <clears throat> and I went with him all day out into a uh, coal mine and or a, a non-coal mine in Pennsylvania. And he showed me everything that was done. So that experience was excellent for me. And I, I read as much as I could about blasting. And then uh, after I was done writing my blasting scene, I sent it over to my friend and um, he had a couple of comments and he told me that some of the things that I was, some of the terms that I was using were just wrong. They were sort of what lay people use as terms. He said a blaster would never use those terms. And so he corrected me, which was very helpful as well. So I would say the most daunting thing uh, that all of us are faced with is the, is the, is the research part. And uh, and that, that's true whether you're writing a story about the president of the United States or whether you're writing a story about uh, coal mining or whether you're writing a story about fracking. Because I think you want to get it right. I think you owe it to yourself. Your book is going to live on in perpetuity after you're done, after you're done with it and it goes out into the world. And you want to make sure that you get it right. I, I've been to many, many uh, conferences and uh, many of the writers have their, their, their gun with a safety uh, case. So some handguns have safeties, some get handguns do not have safeties. And the people who know guns know which ones have safeties, like a Smith & Wesson, and which ones don't have safeties, like a Glock. And if you get it wrong, you're going to hear <laughs> from the whole gun world, they're going to they're be in touch with you to tell you that you got it wrong. <laughs> I got something wrong about baseball in one of my stories, and I should have known better. But um, I, I just had a little quirky thing, but it was so small, I figured nobody would care about it. But somebody did, and I heard from uh, that person telling me that I had that one thing wrong. So people are out there, I don't know that they're necessarily looking to tell you that <laughs> you screwed up, but 
but they find it and somehow or another, they reach back to you through your website or they get your email or whatever, they call you where they see you at a conference. Oh, I read your book, but you, know, you had that thing wrong about baseball. And it's like, oh, God, of course, you found it. So that's the most difficult thing. So I know we had another question. Yeah, Mona, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm writing an adult fantasy that takes place about 5,000 years in the future, and I'm considering it climate fiction. And um, you talked about science fiction, but you haven't said anything about fantasy. So are you lumping the two together? Uh, as some authors do, and some authors um, have used the terms interchangeably, science fiction, fantasy, um, so what is your opinion on that? Or do you have one? Well, it probably doesn't help you that uh, people who write in that genre often refer to it as SFF, right? Science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. And there's a, uh, I mean, they're really two very, very different things. Right now, um, uh, when I do my walk, I listen to, Ar I'm listening to Artemis by Weir, which is a great book. And that's, a, that's you know, set in the future, not in the distant future, maybe about a hundred years in the future. And that's a science fiction story. It's not hard science fiction, but it's science fiction story. And uh, in my writing group is a woman who's writing a story set about 10,000 years in the future. And that, that is a book that sort of verges from science fiction into fantasy because there's some fantastical aspects to it. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I, what, you, what you should probably be thinking about is, and, and they say this, and it's like your fondest dream. Where in the bookstore are they gonna place your book? Are they gonna place it with the science fiction books? Are they gonna place it with the fantasy books? And I don't think you need to worry about that part too much, but what you wanna be thinking about is, who's my audience? Are my, is my audience gonna be people who love science fiction? Is it gonna be fantasy re readers? Is it gonna be a crossover? Is it gonna be people who read both science fiction and fantasy? Because we know that there are people who love both genres. So I think you need to be thinking in terms of that. The other thing is there are certain conventions, and I'm not going to pretend to know them. There are certain conventions in science fiction, and then there are different convention conventions in fantasy. And if you write a book that's a fantasy, but you're writing it with science fiction conventions or vice versa, I, I, you, know, you might put off people who are expecting certain things. So I don't know that I'm really answering your question because I, I don't really have a strong view on it one way or the other. But I would say that you need to be aware of what your story is. And I, and I could certainly see a fiction story about climate change, or sorry, a fantasy story about climate change. But I think that um, you want to make sure that you're abiding by the conven conventions of fantasy mm -hmm. and that you are um, incorporating into it uh, what I assume are going to be you know, your speculation about climate change run amok. So, right, and it's and it's a um, worldview fantasy, adult, however, not young like Harry Potter. Well, that wasn't even worldview per se, but it's not youth coming of age. It is adults recognizing their naivete and growing into it. So I understand that aspect of the conventions. So I think what you're saying is most important is figuring out who the readership is going to be because it's not the the swords and and uh, dragons it's yeah yeah I think that is going to be the most important part I think so and, and I think that's you, know, you want to be thinking to yourself okay here are my 10 friends who love fantasy are they going to like this is this the kind of book that they would like or well one of them does <laughs> I hope everybody does, but yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, you want you want to make sure that you're going to reach those people who are going to like those uh, those books. Mm -hmm. I dreamed it, so yeah, it's one of those books that I had put away for a year, and then I got it out and started rewriting it because it wasn't working. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So. Well, good luck. Thank you. I just wanted to check and see if anyone had any last questions before we end at five o'clock here. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Joel. This was incredibly informative. I really enjoyed the session. Um, and I think that everyone here did as well. Um, so everyone, you know, go out, check out Joel's books, um, be in contact. And I will see you all in, I guess, 
three weeks from now, basically. Um, and, you know, keep an eye out for the newsletter and you'll see when their next Wednesday on the Stoop is. And have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Go out and write a great book. Okay. I found this on the web. For what are you going to write?